right. Welcome, everyone. Are you are you feeling the Wednesday energy? Yes. No. Just me. <laughs> got to uh, got to do what we we can in the face of uh, uh, Minnesota spring. Uh, all right. Lab one. Uh, do 9 p.m. tonight. Uh, late days can be used for 24-hour extensions. Just send me an email to let me know that you're using one or more. If, uh, you can use them kind of one at a time as needed. Uh, lab 2 uh, is available via the course calendar. I'll be talking some more about that today. Um, any questions on uh, labs or any of the assembly things that we've been looking at? Okay. Uh, four for the term. Other questions? All right. So one uh, interesting kind of control flow structure that we haven't talked about yet, which uh, will kind of bring in the final kind of jump uh, instruction assembly, which we also haven't talked about, uh, is the switch state. So this is something that you may have seen before. Uh, Java has a switch statement that it took from C, works the same way. Uh, so does anyone, uh, does anyone sort of describe the general idea of a switch statement? Fine. I mean, it's a whole lot like it can like conditional, except it has like Yeah, it's a kind of different way of approaching maybe a big chain of if, else if, else if, else. So we give the switch statement some argument, uh, and then We have something like this. Uh, what kind of arguments can we give a switch statement? Can it be anything, or are there some restrictions? Fine. It has to be like the value. Uh, it does have to be a value. It could it be an array. No, it has to be uh, basically an, an integer value, whether that's a single character or uh, an int or a long. It's not going to be able to be a float, and it's not going to be able to be any structure. No arrays, no structs. Uh, Kevin? Um, I have a that I'm All right. So... Some sort of integer value. And then the syntax is we have some number of cases, and for each case, we put down a specific integer value that we're going to match with whatever the input is. So let's say I'm giving it some variable x. I might say in the case where x is 5, do this. In the case where x is 0, do this, and then default says, in all other cases, here's what you do. So we could have equivalently written something like if x is 5, else if x is 0, else. So it's kind of a different way of expressing this sort of chain of conditions. Questions on this basic idea of a switch? Oh, okay. yeah. Go into this, but what are the benefits of using switch? Yeah, great question. We will we will definitely talk about that. All right. So here's an example of a kind of thing that we might want to use switch to do. Um, Let's say I have a function that I'll call do operator. It's going to take in two integers, and it's a function that should 
be able to do different things with those, those two entries. It should add them, multiply them, divide them, subtract them, uh, do them as exponents. And to control which kind of operation this function performs, there's also an argument called op. And here, uh, I could have just made op an integer and have like hard put in the code like the integer value 0, 1, 2, 3 that I'm matching it up with, but instead I've used the enumeration type in C, which just creates these names, add sub mold div x, and assigns integer values starting with zero to those names. So add is just kind of another name for zero, sub is another name for one, and so on. Just a way of like giving different integer values different names for uh, the operation that they're going to represent. And so when, uh, when implementing this function, I use a switch statement to say, okay, based on what this variable matches, does it match the value for add, meaning is it zero, does it match sub, mole, div, or x, then kind of return addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, or computing an exponent. Does this make sense, how this switch statement is, is being used here? So like in the previous, uh, the, the simpler example on the board, we could structure this as an if else if. So the switch is not letting us express something that we can't do with if and else if. Um, but I would say readability wise, this is a little easier to read in terms of kind of the case by case logic. So there's kind of um, say a moderate kind of style thing. If we have a bunch of these cases, uh, a switch can express that a little more uh, uh, legibly. Kind of. So I have a quick question about switch versus if and else. So in if and else, at least in the Python, it goes like if and then the next else if and then the next else if, and then it just goes down, right? Mm -hmm. For a switch statement, does it go top to bottom or does it just jump? So like if if you say um, off is equal to like exp, right, which is one mm -hmm. does it does it even consider case pass sub mold? Yeah, so this is a great question, and this gets to why efficiency-wise, this sort of switch approach might actually get us a little bit of benefit, because uh, you're exactly right that uh, if we turn this big chain of if-else-if if into assembly, we might get a whole bunch of like, uh, like compare and jumps, kind of one after another as we check all the different cases, Whereas, as we'll see when we compare a switch, we're going to just do a single jump straight to the case that we want to execute. Uh, so there's going to be an advantage there. Um, so how do we actually implement this uh, on the computer system? Uh, for that, uh, we're going to have in memory uh, basically a lookup table. So we can think of it's going to be a portion of memory which are the kind of different blocks of code that correspond to the different cases of our switch statement. Um, and they won't necessarily appear in the same, there's, they don't have to show up in the same order that the cases are in in the switch statement. But we might imagine that this corresponds to the add case, the sub case, mole, div, x, and default. And the order of these, I've just picked an order, it's not necessarily going to be put in this specific order, as, as, we, will, as we will see. Uh, but we have some set of code blocks. Uh, and then elsewhere in memory, we have what's called the jump table, which is just an array of pointers, each of which points to one of our code blocks. So 
I'd say, again, if just assuming that kind of the order of these happens to match the order of these, the first mm -hmm. element of this jump table is the address of this add code block. And the second element is the address of, kind of the start of the sub code block and so on. So we have a, a jump table that has kind of a bunch of pointers um, to our different code blocks. And the final piece that makes this work is an indirect jump uh, uh, expression. So let's say our jump table is located, just to pick a number, at address x1000. So the compiler has put the jump table in memory at address 1000. And we want to switch based on uh, this parameter op. And so I'm going to say op is the first argument to our function. Uh, so what register will op be stored in? RDI. Exactly. It will be in RDI. And so we can have an instruction that says jump. But we'll have an asterisk, which is the indication that this is an indirect jump. And what that says is we're going to give it an address in memory. Give myself a little more room. An address in memory. It will look something like this. And what this indirect jump says is we're going to give it an address in memory. That's where it will go look to get the address it should actually jump to. And so it says go to address 1000, which is where our jump table starts, plus the value of op times 8. Any ideas of why we would multiply this by 8? What's that? So um, the RDI will point to different uh, eight byte chunks where the pointers are, because that's how long the pointer is. Exactly. We're actually using op the, this parameter here, which is going to be like zero, one, two, three, um, as an index into this jump table, where kind of each element is an eight byte pointer. So to kind of get from one element to the other, we go in kind of eight byte steps. And so this says, go to this address, and then basically dereference that pointer to like use that pointer, uh, use the value in memory there as where we jump to. So I go to like this point in the jump table, there's some address stored there that is the address of sub, and that's actually where we jump. So we're kind of using this jump table to kind of look up where in memory the program should jump to. Fine. So basically, the, the jump table is the jump table is exactly an array of pointers. Again, in this case, OP has to like go from zero to something. Um, yeah, so switch statements kind of work best when we have uh, when our cases are continuous or close to continuous. If the cases all are all over the place, we likely can't do it with a jump table and we're actually going to not probably not going to use an indirect jump at all. Uh, but situations like this, where we do have just like an enumeration, and our cases are like zero through some number, that's not uncommon. Um, so uh, this is helpful in that case. Like, why don't we need a dollar sign on that eight? Uh, so this scale part of um, of the memory operand can actually only be one, two, four, eight. Uh, and it's not a sort of, uh, and the dollar sign is to distinguish between interpreting this constant as a memory address versus interpreting it as an integer constant. 
This scale factor is just always an integer constant, so we don't need kind of extra symbols to distinguish that. But yeah, this was always this will always be one, literally one, two, four, eight kind of different sizes of data um, on our system. Can you explain the asterisk? Yeah. So if I didn't have this asterisk, this would be a direct jump, and it would jump to this address. So we'd start trying to execute the bytes in the jump table. The jump table is not code, so terrible things would happen. With the asterisk, we say kind of, this is a two-step process. First, go to this memory address, and then use the value you find there as where you actually jump to. Other questions? All right, so let's finish this by taking uh, a look at what we see in, in Godbolt. So I have the, the do operator function over here. Uh, what we see here is kind of instructions uh, that the compiler uh, is giving to set up the jump table. So it's saying at label four, put, and the dot quad is eight byte quantities, kind of put this array of eight bytes first with the address of all these other labels. So this is just sort of set, the, the compiler telling the system set up the jump table like this. And if we look at how the switch statement starts out, we first compare uh, the value four, to EDI, which is one of our first, the register, the four byte version of the register that has our, our first argument. Uh, and then my default just exits, and I see JA to dot L2, and go down and see dot L2 calls exit. So that suggests that this jump to L2 is taking care of the default case. Why, why are we comparing it to four to check this default case? Huh? Because we only have uh, four possible operations. So yeah, that's, we have our different cases are zero, one, two, three, and four. And this jump A stands for jump above, which says jump if EDI is greater than four as an unsigned number. So you have jump above and jump below, which are like jump greater than, jump less than, but interpreting uh, things as unsigned. So they say if the input is above four as an unsigned number, it's not gonna match our cases zero, one, two, three, four. So then we jump to the default. Does that make sense? And after we, uh, after we do that check, should we go to default, uh, it then kind of saves RDX uh, in this register R8, um, does this sort of interesting thing to uh, clear out the higher four bits of EDI, higher four bytes of EDI, so we just have the lower four bytes, uh, and then we see our, our indirect jump is going to kind of direct us to one of these labels that kind of implements our different uh, our different switch cases. Oh. When you do unsigned integers, um, is it absolute value wise or uh, it's it's taking whatever the bits are and interpreting them as an unsigned integer rather than two's complement. So um, yeah, so it's just take whatever the binary is. Uh, yeah, the binary isn't changing; we're just interpreting it uh, in, different, in a different way. Other questions? All right, and just to show you what the alternative looks like, uh, if we have our if else if version, and we look at how that compiles, we see this just big chain of compare and jump, compare and jump, compare and jump. So we'd end up kind of doing a lot more compare and jumps in this way if we happen to get to need to go to one of the lower cases. Um, Although I learned just today that if you look at what the kind of a much newer version of the GNU C compiler does, 
it actually takes this chain of if else it else if else if else if and it's smart enough to recognize oh I can do this with a jump table. So even when the C code wasn't a switch like the newest C compilers can figure out uh, that it can be more efficient by compiling it as if it was a switch statement. Uh, so uh, the takeaway is that when we have these cases like this, we can kind of use this indirect jump to be more efficient. And depending on the compiler we're using, maybe that is just when we use a switch statement or, uh, or more general. All right, any other questions on the switch statement? What's the name of quad again? Uh, quad just says put this in eight bytes. Quad word oh. is our kind of eight byte uh, size in assembly. So it means like put the address of dot .la. Yeah. So um, like this, if we this is an instruction to the system to create the jump table in memory. So it's saying some whatever address you compile L4 to, at that address have an array of five eight byte things, and the first one should be whatever address L8 is, the next one whatever address L7 is, and so on. So it's like instructions to the system to how it should set up this jump table. Uh, if we compile all the way, uh, that, that set of instructions doesn't actually appear in the compiled assembly. That kind of gets compiled in kind of a different, um, uh, it gets compiled as kind of literally part of the, uh, the data that's loaded in with the code. Um, and those, those instructions we saw in the, uh, those kind of directives we saw in the assembly are telling it how, how to do that. Uh, and we can see that the indirect jump gets compiled to a kind of specific address where this jump table has been put in memory uh, as kind of all our labels get replaced with specific addresses when we actually compile all the way. All right. So now I want to talk about uh, how we deal with arrays uh, in memory, and also uh, it's going to uh, we're going to see some kind of new things about pointers in C. So uh, if I have an expression or a declaration where t is a type, a is a variable name, n is a number, what is this, what is this declare in C? Why? An array of type t. Yeah, we have an array of things of type t, and how many things in the array? Uh, yeah, we have n things. So, how we declare an array? So if I had something like Star message twelve. I get I have an array of twelve one byte characters where this variable message is the address of the start and the address at the end here would be message plus 12, 12 bytes away from the start of the array. If I had double a bracket three, again, I get three doubles. How many bytes are in a double? Yeah, eight in our kind of double precision uh, floating point quantity. Uh, so if we think about what is the address uh, of the end of this array, it would be 24 bytes away from the start. So one thing that I've mentioned before, but we're going to see a lot more of today is that when we talk about arrays and pointers in C, they're the same thing. An array is just a pointer to the start. Like a variable that's an array is just a pointer to uh, the start of that array. 
So uh, that means that uh, the expression x, um, yeah, so let's say if I have an array of five integers, I can initialize it to a specific array, like so. Then uh, when I say x bracket 4, what does that return? Uh, pointer to the star. Oh, next, two, three. Um, so if I'm kind of using the brackets with 4, um, that's going to like uh, get the element at index 4. Um, I'm seeing some people hold up as 5. And if I did, this is actually just convenient syntax. For this expression. What we're seeing here is take the pointer to the start of this array of ints, take this pointer to an int, and move it four integers forward in memory, and then dereference that. So that these are kind of exactly the same operation. Uh, so this would also be five, and this is an example of something called pointer arithmetic in C, which is the When we add to a pointer in C, it's going to scale that addition, it's going to kind of uh, multiply that addition uh, by the size of the data type. Peter. Uh, so, like in this case, why is F4 not like F4 times the size of the integer? Yeah, so that's exactly right, that what this will actually do is add four times the size of an integer. And that's something that C is, is doing when we add four to a pointer to an integer. Um, and so if I had written times the size of an integer, it would be as if I'm adding 20, and then that 20 would be scaled by the size of the thing x points to. So this means that when we add and then you're to a pointer, we sort of move forward in memory that many kind of elements of that type. Um, and so if if I did message plus five, how many bytes would that add to the address of message? Honors? Exactly, why five? Those characters are one byte. Yes, so we'd scale by the size of a character, which is one. So we'd just get an address five bytes away from message, whereas if we did A plus five, how many bytes away from A would the address be? Not 40. Exactly, the five would be scaled by the size of the double, and we get an address 40 bytes away from A. This point arithmetic makes sense. What are your what are your question comments? All right. Uh, yeah, Marcus. So if you did um, A plus five is out of range, what like what's the like what would be like the consequence of that? Uh, so just adding five to A just gives us an address that's past the end of this array, and just having that address, you know. 
we have an address that points somewhere. If we were to dereference that address, uh, there are various possible. The, the behavior is undefined because it sort of depends on you know what is in memory over here. Maybe this memory isn't being used for anything, and so reading or writing it doesn't cause any problems at all. Maybe it's storing something important, like the return address for a function, and now we've kind of badly damaged information the program needs. Um, maybe it's kind of outside the bounds of the memory our program is allowed to access, and so the operating system says no, and terminates the program. So this execution is called. So, uh, Many different things can happen when we start doing stuff with memory we're not supposed to. Well, so I think in a, in a previous lab we've done something like um, indexing a pointer, and is that since like syntactically it's different, but uh, and does that encode for the same like pointer arithmetic that's happening here? Yeah. So this is really getting to like pointers and arrays. There's just no difference. So if we have X declared as a pointer to an integer versus X declared as an array, like these things do the same thing with X either way. And when we pass an array to a function, it is just passed as a pointer. There is just no difference between a, a pointer and an array. Um, other questions? All right, a little bit of uh, practice. So. Uh, I'd like you to think about the uh, type and value of each of the following expressions. X plus 1, ampersand, X bracket 2, X bracket 5, X plus I. So for each of these four, we're looking for the type and the value given this instantiation of X. Uh, so work with your neighbors to uh, write down the type and value of each of these four. All right, let's talk about these, uh, these different expressions. Let's start with x plus 1. Uh, suggestion for what type of value we get when we do x plus 1. Huh? Is that just an integer? Uh, why do you say an integer? Because x is a memory address. Yeah, so if x is a memory address uh, and we add 1, we will get we will still get a memory address. Um, and so uh, I might say that this would be a, a pointer to an int. As we started with a pointer and an int, we basically moved it kind of one integer over. Uh, and so we're still left with a pointer just to kind of maybe the... the no, the, the second element in the array. Uh, does that make sense? Um, yeah, so if we, if we put down a, a value, we might say a plus four. four. So we move kind of four bytes away from the, the address of the start of the array. Uh, how about our ampersand x bracket two? You should? Uh, it's an int pointer. I, uh, how did you get int star? Uh, because it's the address of whatever, uh, like, because x with this bracket to is actually the exact value of where of, of a store in the address. So if you get the address, it's actually getting a point. Exactly. This gave us, in this case, 1, uh, the second uh, the, the element index 2, and then we got the address of that. So we have a pointer to this integer 1, that would be an int star. Uh, what address would that be? You know? um, a plus h. Exactly. I've moved two integers away from the start of our array. 
Uh, X bracket five. Uh, it's of type int, and it's the value of the four bits after the array. So a plus twenty. Um, yeah, it's whatever value is stored at a plus twenty, uh, which we have no earthly idea what would be stored there. It's past the end of our array. Doesn't mean we can't read whatever bytes happen to be there, but we just have no idea what they might be. So unlike other languages, he doesn't give you like the next round of Absolutely not. It's hey, you're the programmer. You know exactly what you're doing. You definitely meant to access this uh, these four bytes past the end of your array. Uh, yeah. So no, it it will be just fine with that until uh, and so we'll let you kind of do out of bounds things that um, you know, have bad bad uh, results. Uh, how about this last one? X plus some integer variable i. Uh, it seems sort of weird because it, it kind of depends on what i is, but you're either a plus 4i as a value as the integer pointer, or um, so take so I'm not quite sure what would happen if, you go, if i is greater than 4, because then you're past the like, array of ints, so you don't know how much to scale. Um, yeah, so that's a good point. Because x is a pointer to an integer, uh, c is just going to scale this addition by the size of n. So it's always going to be scaled by 4. Uh, but you're right that if a is greater than 4, we're definitely going to get an address that's past the end uh, of the array, which, depending on what we do with that address, could be bad. Any questions on, on these four, four examples? These make sense? All right. Today, I want to tell you about the uh, first um, kind of uh, uh, the first political parties in the U.S. Um, uh, that ran on an explicitly anti-slavery platform. Uh, this began with the, the Free Soil Party um, and uh, former President Martin Van Buren ran as the candidate uh, for the Free Soil Party. Um, this kind of didn't really get much traction, but kind of started this, uh, uh, this kind of political movement and a bunch of different kind of small uh, groups that held similar values uh, came together to form the Republican Party. Uh, which ran its first presidential candidate, John Fremont, who was a kind of noted uh, explorer um, uh, as uh, a candidate and had the, the, the catchy slogan, uh, uh, free men, free labor, free soil, uh, Fremont. And uh, he did all right, but, you know, not uh, did not win that election. You can see that the uh, Whig Party, which former President Miller Tillmore ran as the Whig candidate, was basically completely uh, defunct. And so Fremont lost to James Buchanan, uh, this guy, nicknamed the old public functionary, um, only U.S. president to uh, have never married, be a lifelong bachelor. Um, uh, perhaps unrelated, widely regarded as one of the worst presidents in U.S. history. Um, <laughs> Uh, basically, was uh, uh, the country was um, in quite a lot of, of turmoil. The issue of, uh, of slavery was uh, creating kind of enormous um, political disagreement. There were people bludgeoning each other in Congress, uh, and Buchanan kind of didn't have anything to contribute to solving this problem. Um, uh, this is Miller Fillmore, by the way. Um, and so in uh, 1860, the uh, Republicans kind of won their first presidential election uh, with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, this um, uh, uh, was a uh, complicated election with um, kind of the, uh, the Democratic 
party running different candidates in the in the north and southern states. Um, and so Abraham Lincoln kind of won the Electoral College without a majority of uh, of the po uh, popular vote. Uh, and uh, his election uh, and this was an instance where the person who won the presidential election literally did not appear on the ballot in many southern states. Um, and uh, as I'm sure many of you know, this uh, then precipitated the, um, uh, thankfully, the, the first and thankfully only uh, civil war uh, in the U.S. Uh, also kind of inaugurated what is called the third party system by political scientists, uh, where kind of, uh, for example, New York was a key swing state between Republicans and Democrats um, for the next several decades. Uh, but in general, politics became very sectional, with northern states supporting the Republican Party and southern states supporting the Democratic Party. All right, that's enough political history. Uh, what I'd like to talk about now is uh, Lab 2. So uh, Lab 2 will direct you to go to uh, a particular URL, and you'll see something like this, uh, the binary bomb request. Uh, and so what has happened is uh, the uh, nefarious uh, Mr. Doctor the Professor has uh, infested uh, a um, CS department server with uh, binary bombs. Uh, and your mission, which you have no choice but to accept, is to uh, acquire one of these bombs and defuse it. So to acquire a bomb, you'll enter your Carlton username and your email. Uh, it is important that you enter your username and email so we can uh, so we know kind of which bomb goes with which person. Uh, because what you'll be able to do is you'll download some file. We'll say bomb and then a number, and it will be a tar file. And uh, you're being given a compiled program that you're going to have to figure out how to diffuse, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. But because this program was compiled on Linux, you have to, it will only run on a Linux computer, and so you won't be able to work on this uh, unless you're working on Mantis, or the Windows subsystem for Linux, or a Linux virtual machine that you have on your laptop. Um, so uh, in the case of Mantis, um, we'll, uh, Connect to that. Once it connects, I'll want to uh, open a folder. And open documents, CS208, Spring 22. And then to get that bomb file on to Mantis, where I can actually run it, uh, I can uh, just drag it over to the list of files, and that will upload it to Mantis. Uh, and then in the terminal, I will extract this, and that will create a folder, bomb10. Um, which has different things. It has a README, very exciting. Uh, it has a couple empty text files. Um, it has bomb.c, which, uh, let me make this not tiny, um, which has the main function for this, for this bomb. Uh, and the main function is not very interesting. The main thing that it does is it reads a line uh, of your input that you put into the terminal and then calls one of these phase functions with that input. And the way this bomb is structured is that it has six phases, each of which requires a specific uh, input to diffuse. And so your task is to figure out what inputs are required to diffuse each phase of the bomb, and they go in order. So you have to diffuse phase one in order to arrive at phase two, uh, and so on. Uh, and so we can look at what this looks like when I run it. So I say dot slash bomb, 
prints out a message, welcome to my Phoenix little bomb. You have six phases with which to blow yourself up. Have a nice day. Um, please don't explode. Fortunately, that was not the diffusing phase. It says, boom, the bomb has blown up. Uh, your instructor has been notified. Uh, it does indeed notify me. Um, uh, however, there is no penalty other than I will know uh, when you explode a bomb. And the hand uh, the write up uh, the write up gives a there's a progress page where I can see bomb ten zero phases diffused one explosion. Um, and so you will kind of be able to see kind of what the, and, and so this is, there is, for, in terms of diffusing the bomb, there is nothing that you need to submit because as you diffuse the phases, it is automatically, that information is automatically sent um, to this to the server and recorded. Uh, there is a, so working, running this bomb requires an internet connection. Um, however, there is another file, bomb-quiet, which is exactly the same as the bomb, except it doesn't try and automatically send any results. So if you, you can work on this without an internet connection by using this bomb-quiet file, and you just need to like run it and diffuse it with the one that talks to the internet uh, at least once in order to get the, the results sent in. Um, so there are six phases. The phases are worth different amounts of points that are described in the write-up. Uh, so one way to approach the lab is to uh, try and uh, kind of, uh, try and figure out just the information you need to diffuse each phase and not explode the bomb. Um, and this is sort of the kind of hacking reverse engineering sort of approach to the lab. There's uh, this descriptions.txt uh, is the sort of alternate approach to the lab where you can submit a description of up to two of the phases that you successfully diffused, not counting phase one. Um, and the write-up describes kind of what sort of information go in that goes in that description. Uh, but this means that you could, for example, diffuse the first four phases and then kind of analyze two of them very carefully such that you can write up a description of, kind of what is going on in those phases. Huh. In so it's data of deleting all six. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So um, and uh, the write up kind of has more details. Please um, let me know if you if you have questions about that. Uh, so how do you go about trying to figure out what's going on in this bomb? Uh, the main tool for that is going to be the GNU debugger or GDB, and uh, that works something like this. Um, I run GDB and then the executable bomb. And if I have something in GDB and I just do run, it will run the program. Um, but it will just run the program normally. I still ask for an input. I still blow up the bomb. So what I would really like to do is to have the program stop kind of at the point where it's doing something with that, that input so that I can see what it's doing uh, and figure out what input I should give it. And to do this, I can use what's called a breakpoint, which is you know, tell GDB a specific spot in the code that I want it to stop, uh, that I want it to pause the program uh, so that I can see what's going on. So I do that by break, and I'll give it the function name of phase one. And a first function that takes the, the first uh, phase of, of the bomb. So now it's at a breakpoint there. And so now if I run it, it asks me, here we go again. But now it has, before it blows up, it has stopped at phase one. So there are a few things that I can do here. I can run the command layout asm, or layout asm, to get a view that shows me the assembly of the function that I'm currently on. Uh, and I can also do layout rig to also have it show me uh, some of the registers. Um, and 
Now, uh, the other thing I can do, another useful thing I can do with GDB is to go through this function a single line of assembly at a time. It's often called like step through the function. So if I run step i, short for step instruction, that's going to go kind of one instruction forward. So I can see that it subtracted eight from the RSP register, and now it's on this register that's moving this hex number into ESI. So I might wonder, well, what is this hex number? Uh, I can print out the hex number and show me the value in decimal. That was not particularly uh, informative. Uh, GDB can, as an aside, just act as a converter. If I give it a decimal and say print, slash x to tell it to print in hexadecimal. Uh, it will give me that. I could print slash d for show me what is hex. Hmm. What is uh, hex 8976. Show me that in decimal. Um, anyone have a guess for what like, what does this hex number look like? Fine. Like, we can think of different, we've seen like integers or uh, floats or kind of other kinds of data. Does this look like one of those kinds? Nick? Oh, I was going to say, I mean, it's got six. Uh, I was gonna say, like it looks like the RGB text that we used. Yeah, I so think this could certainly be interpreted as a color, though that seems a little unlikely given this text-based program. Fuchsia? It's the address of the whole block, right? Like, so don't do that, and then and then and then and then like your your double your window, like on that, there's the same as like the zero x for t thirteen e six. So I suppose it's somewhere. Yeah, so I see kind of the address of each of these instructions over here on the left, and this looks like like those addresses. So in addition to printing things in uh, GDB, I can use the X command to examine something, basically dereference a pointer and just show me what's at that point in memory. So if I examine this value, I see 92. Um, so this is showing me what's there as uh, um, as a, a, a decimal. Um, what are other kinds of things that can be stored in memory? Could be a character. Uh, so it looks like it's thinking that there's a, oh no, this is, not 4058. This should be it's just the wrong number. 4031A0. So looks like there's a capital I if I interpret the byte there as a character. What other kinds of things are stored in there? Huh? Sorry, I don't have the next answer, but I'm curious why was it? I I thought like we got six hex numbers for one one file. Yeah, so this is the address. Right. Okay. So in if I go to this address and look at one byte there, I find seventy three, which is the letter. If I turn it to ASCII, it's the letter I. I see. Um, I'm a little confused why the address is only three bytes long when I assume we're running around with like a six. Yeah, so the code, uh, if um, the, the kind of code region of memory uh, is located at low addresses, the stack is at high addresses, the heap is in the middle, and so it turns out that these low addresses um, are indeed like have a bunch of leading zeros and 
so they are eight bytes, but it's just leaving out a bunch of the zeros. Um, yeah, so this next line of assembly, which we haven't gotten to yet, says call Q. It's going to call a function. And GDB is helpfully telling us the name of the function, strings not equal. Um, so this makes me think, well, maybe I should look around in memory, interpreting things as a string. So if I say x slash s, to say interpret as a string, this memory address, I see that the string stored there, famous <laughs> quote from Lyndon Johnson when he announced he was not going to run for re-election, um, I shall not seek, nor will I accept the nomination of my party. Uh, and so I have found this string stored in memory that phase one is doing something with. Uh, and so this may be related to the string that um, phase one is expecting, that this particular bomb uh, expects for phase one. I'm also seeing that I'm moving this address into ESI, which is one of the registers that holds an argument to a function, before I call a function named strings not equal. So this also potentially suggests like what this function might be checking about, uh, about strings. Um, so this is the uh, kind of, uh, general uh, uh, approach to, to take to the lab is to using GDB to kind of look what the assembly is doing as you step through instruction by instruction. You can use it to look at what values are in memory. You can also look at what values are in registers. Uh, unhelpfully, GDB has you put a dollar sign before the register name rather than the percent sign that appears in the assembly code. I think this is deeply unfortunate, but this is what the tool does. So I can print RDI and see that it's this decimal value. But if I examine RDI, I see that it in fact has a string in it, and it's the string that I entered when the bomb kind of prompted me for, for a string. So I can kind of look at register values, look at what's in memory, step through instruction and by instruction, and through this process, figure out what input does this phase need, uh, such that the function returns without ever calling explode bomb. So I can see that there is a jump uh, before a return. The jump is to phase one plus 23, which I see here. So as long as I get this not to jump to explode bomb, the function will return without exploding and kind of go from there. Um, another thing that I can do in, um, uh, in GDB is run the disassemble command and give it a function name. Um, I think I misspelled that. Um, Interesting. Let's just add phase two. Okay, that seemed to work. So I can look at the assembly code for phase two. Um, and kind of once I figure out phase one, I'll move on looking at phase two. Uh, and I see a function here called read six numbers. Um, and uh, as the name suggests, this function is doing something to read six numbers. Uh, and I want to take our remaining few minutes, and I'll continue with this on Friday, uh, looking at this read six numbers function. Um, the bomb doesn't give you the C code, but I'm going to give you the C code, because some stuff this function does is going to be helpful in kind of understanding a lot of, a lot of what's going on um, in assembly. Uh, so we'll go back to uh, Godbolt. And start by looking at this function here. So uh, 
I have a main that declares uh, an array of six integers and then called read six numbers, passing it a string uh, and this array of integers. Note that the read six numbers takes the this array as a pointer to an integer because that's in fact what the array is, just a pointer to the first first element of numbers. Uh, and then it uses this C library function, which came from this standard I.O., called scanf. Uh, so if I said I want to parse a string, what would I mean by that? What? Uh, you want to like take the characters in a string and turn them into values of a different data type. Yeah, I want to take some string, like break it up, and as the name of this function suggests, I want to take a string and like break it up into six different numbers. Um, and so this s scanf super useful function uh, that can take a string and then take a, a second string that tells it how to break up the first string, and then it will kind of match up the parts of the first string with uh, spots in memory. So what's happening here is I'm saying, okay, I want to parse this input string, and here is the format that I want to parse it by. And it uses the same kind of format specifiers that printf does in C, and in fact the same like slash D or slash X or slash S that I was using in, in GDB, those same letters are kind of used throughout all these tools, uh, where D just means decimal number. And so this, Format says I expect a decimal number and then a space and then a decimal number and then a space and then a decimal number and a space and kind of that's how I'm going to parse. That's how I'm going to break up uh, this input string and then the rest of the arguments to scanf are memory addresses where it's going to store each separate thing that it parses, each separate part that the format gives it. So I'm saying here I want to parse six of these numbers. So then scanf needs six separate memory addresses, where the first memory address is, will it, is where it will store the first number that it parses. The second memory address that I give it will be where it stores the second number that it extracts from the input string, and so on. And we're bringing in the idea of pointer arithmetic that we uh, just talked about where I have numbers, I'm assuming it points to the start of an array, and I say, all right, put the first, the address where scanf should store the first number is the first, the address of the start of the array, the next is the address of the start of the array plus one. Will that go one byte forward from numbers? Yeah, we'll go four bytes forward because it scales by the size of the data type. And so we can see that scanf is just kind of taking the address of, of each uh, kind of different elements of this array numbers as all the spots where it should stick these numbers that it's extracting from this input. So can take a look at the assembly here. And so we'll start just looking at the main function. The first thing we see is that it subtracts 40 from RSP. This is how memory is allocated on the stack. And you may remember that memory it gets automatically allocated on the stack. This is how that automatic allocation happens, is that we have the stack, the region of memory, we have this special register RSP, the stack pointer, that just stores the address that is the uh, boundary of the stack. And because the stack is stored at high addresses in memory, to put more, to add space to the stack, we simply subtract from RSP 
that has moved down and now a larger region of memory is considered part of the stack. So in order to make room for, kind of to allocate space for the, this array of six integers, it's going to be this kind of local array on the stack. The program, in this case, subtracts 40 bytes from RSP. Like why specifically 40? Uh, I'm happy to, uh, it's not very interesting, but there is some kind of way the compiler is deciding that it should be 40. Um, and we know that stack memory is automatically deallocated, and that's simply done by adding that same amount back to our stack point. So at the start of the function, we subtracted 40, we kind of added new space on the stack for this function, and then at the end, we deallocate it by just moving the stack pointer back up. And now that part is no longer considered part of the stack and could be reused for memory on the stack that's allocated in the future. So that's where I'll leave it for today. We'll pick up next time getting into the assembly for this read six numbers. Uh, for, uh, I encourage you to uh, work on phase one, uh, get a bomb, work on phase one for Friday, uh, uh, and then on Friday we'll talk more about uh, concepts you'll need for the rest of the phases. Uh, I have office hours starting in half an hour, uh, otherwise I'll see you Friday.